The result of my dad passing away when I was 12 was years of anger and bitterness toward God, his creation, and myself. At the time, I didn't seek the appropriate forms of counseling necessary to work through or to understand the grief that had befallen my developing mind, and so I lashed out in all kinds of different ways. One of those ways was during lunchtime in the seventh grade. There was a boy in my class who I would have generally considered to be my friend. Let's call him Cameron. He decided to sit next to me that day, and the only problem was I wanted to be alone. Cameron began talking, and his talking soon turned into flippant comments, which is the case with most 7th grade boys, and those flippant comments soon turned into jabs. Sardonic comments about me, my friends, but by the end of it, my dad. I was so furious. I shot up out of my seat, walked over to Cameron, and kicked him square in the forehead. I should add, he was sitting on the ground. I wasn't like some jujitsu master in middle school. I kicked him in the forehead and everyone around me went quiet. Austin! I heard my name echo around the courtyard walls as a furious dean of students huffed over to where I was, pulled me into the principal's office, and sent me home early that day. This was years before I became a Christian, by the way, and years before I would hear the balming words of Jesus soothe my ashamed heart. As Christians, what do we do with anger? The real question is, how does the gospel message shape and cultivate within us a heart that is not so easily roused by flippant words, harsh criticisms, or unmet expectations? We may not be able to escape being angry in our lives, but as we will see in this episode, we can certainly destroy our enemies. This is Gospel Unbound. Let's explore. The first time something appears in the Bible, we should always take special note of it. The reason being, because the Bible is so long, we often forget that it's a unified story, which means that the Bible will define terms for itself. In this case, the first time anger appears in the Bible is right out of the gate, in Genesis 4, when Cain kills Abel. This story is crazy fascinating. It tells us a lot about what it means to be human in a fallen world. In the story, we see that Cain is the firstborn male to Adam and Eve, and he becomes a worker of the nettled ground, while his brother, Abel, the youngest of the two, is the keeper of the sheep. Well, one day, Cain brings to God an offering of fruits, a task that would have been difficult given the curse of Adam, while Abel brings the firstborn calf as an offering to God. God has favor for Abel's offering and not for Cain's offering, and since Cain is the firstborn male and likely worked much harder for his offering, he becomes enraged at the entire system. He ends up murdering his brother. If this were the whole story, I think we could see and to empathize with Cain. If we were less aware of how the Bible worked, we might even go so far as to say that Cain had a righteous anger toward God. You know, barring the whole contradiction of that sentiment. It's crucial that we look at how God responds to Cain when he becomes angry and put it into the context of the story so far, which shouldn't be hard given the fact that this is page four. So Cain is very angry, his face fell, and the Lord comes up to Cain and says, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? These, by the way, are rhetorical since he answers himself right away. He says this, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You know, on its face, I'm frustrated by how God responds to Cain. I've been in the sales world and I can tell you firsthand that you always want to find the intersection of desires for both parties. But here, it just seems like God totally wrecks Cain. I mean, with just a sick burn. If you do well, you will be accepted. It simply implies that Cain did not do well. I wouldn't want someone telling me that. Then again, Cain didn't do very well. God does present an intersection of desires. God doesn't want Cain to fall into the trap of sin like Cain's parents, and God says, trust me, neither do you. Neither do you want to fall into the trap of sin? And if Adam and Eve were going to grow up in perfect relationship to God, then it would stand to reason that they would grow up in wisdom by God's timing and not their own, until they ate of the tree of knowing good and bad. 
It's been a long-held church tradition that God would not have kept Adam and Eve in ignorance, but rather he would have allowed them to grow in wisdom and an understanding of the knowledge of good and bad, but in God's timing. We see that very thing taking place right before our eyes in the story of Cain and Abel. God is instructing Cain in the way of righteousness, unlike Adam. And Cain, too, has a choice before him. Forgive his brother, or allow the bitterness to fester in his heart and mind. And in an instant, Cain makes his choice. I like to think that it's this very story, the story of Cain and Abel, that Jesus has on his mind when he begins to dig into his sermon on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going to him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus is, in effect, saying that when we feel anger towards one another, we are declaring to them and to God that they are not worthy of the life that they live. That, like Cain, our being, our sacrifice, our status, is more worthy, more deserving of God's grace than that person is. The most angry people in this world, according to Jesus, are the most selfish people in the world. And I should know. And I think that we should sit in this reality for a little while. That every single time we're mad at someone, we are effectually declaring to them and to God that we are more worthy of grace, that we are more worthy of life than the other person. Because that, my friend, is pride at best and murder when left unchecked. So what do we do? If we know that anger causes malice, wrath, divisiveness, and at times a literal or figurative murder, what do we do? We can't escape being angry. But we can destroy our enemies. Just as Abraham Lincoln once said, If you're a racist, I will attack you with the North. No, 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 no. He, he, he said this. The best way to destroy your enemies is to make them a friend. Now, that might sound like some cute, trite, kumbaya, dead guy in a top hat aphorism, but it isn't. Especially for those of you that actually truly struggle with, with anger or wrath. It is a worldview-shifting reality that orbits itself around the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And to understand the gospel more and more will, over time, melt that anger from your heart. I know this because just a few verses later, Jesus says the exact same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. A sermon that outlines, by the way, the values and ethics upon which the kingdom of God is run, and one of those ethics is the very ability to love your enemies. And you love your enemies in this way, Jesus says. You pray for them, you have grace on and forgive them, and you serve them just as Jesus did for us. Which is the message of the gospel, by the way. That if we can see that our anger towards another person is actually anger towards God, infused with an incredible amount of selfishness, and then we realize that the price of that anger was the life of Jesus from Nazareth. That changes everything. It allows us to see that we are no better than the people we're infuriated with. It allows us to see that we cause just as much damage in the hearts and lives of others as the people we're mad at. It allows us to see that we are not deserving of God's grace at all, in the simple fact that we do receive God's grace should give us the strength to extend that exact same amount of grace and forgiveness to other people, thus making pride and self-centeredness 
void of its power over us. And this is not to say that we go from hating someone else to hating ourselves, because that's forgetting that God's grace is actually real and had upon you, thus making this whole exercise pointless if you just go about hating yourself. But rather than lowering yourself, you see that both of you are made in the image of God and able to receive freely the gift of God's grace and salvation through Jesus Christ. That is the ability to receive grace and forgiveness. Now, there are many among you wondering about this other sinister darkness that lies deep within your hearts that we've not done well to discuss as a church body in the past several decades. It's the free pass, the hidden key, the get out of jail free card on this whole anger conversation. And that, of course, is what the church has called righteous anger. <laughs> Human beings have a tendency to make things the way they want them to be. And so when we talk about anger, we like to talk about righteous anger. So we talk about righteous anger these days and it has completely allowed us to just be mad at that people. Everyone and everything, we're just mad at them, but in the name of God, because we so quickly and easily convince ourselves that the things in the people we are mad at are the exact same things in people that God is mad at. And so it must be righteous anger. All of this is way off base. <laughs> in the tens of thousands of years over which the biblical epic takes place, God gets angry like five times at the flood, at the conquest of Canaan, at the exile of the Israelites, when he flips over tables, and at the end of this age, when he judges sin and injustice. And you would do well to note that in all five of those instances, God is driving out sin and evil from his presence so that righteousness and justice can flourish within his presence. For one, we do not have that kind of power that we should act in those ways so that we become justified in our anger. Two, it is a good thing that God is mad at sin because that means that all the injustices that happen to you throughout your life will one day actually and with finality be wiped clean off the face of history. Three, God is slow to his anger. That is a key perfection of his being according to Exodus 34, 6. So even if you are righteous in your anger, which the human condition would suggest is the exception and almost never the rule, then you ought to be really, really slow to come to that anger. But it does stand a reason that if we have the Holy Spirit living within us, then at times in our lives, we would be upset at injustices and evils committed throughout the world. We should be upset at the evil that has taken over the hearts of the people around us. But we don't go out and scream and shout and flip tables over it. That's completely missing the entire point of the table flipping thing, by the way, because Jesus does it after remaining discreet, and as soon as he does it, they begin to plot his death. So unless you would like the people around you to begin to plot your death, you just shouldn't do the table flipping thing. You just shouldn't try to drive the sin of the people off the face of the earth because that's not your job, that's God's job. We go out and we love the people that are committing those sins and injustices back into right relationship with God. And hopefully you're looking at your screen thinking, that sounds way harder than just protesting because you're right. It is way harder. In fact, I always say that loving your enemies is a great way to get stabbed in the back. And I don't mean that figuratively. Like some people who are prone to anger, who are our enemies, who are prone to murder, who are prone to homicide, they need the love of Jesus Christ and the church is the one to give it to them. And if those kinds of people filled with pride hear that they too are filled with sin, it's a good way to get killed. It got Jesus killed, and it's been killing martyrs of the faith for centuries. But if we actually understand the depths of our forgiveness, if we understand the depths of God's grace, we should begin to see how worthy God is of our obedience to go and to love the people that might destroy us, to serve them, to pray for them, to have grace on and forgiveness for them, and to see that we are no better than them. And you know, I wish I could stand here and tell you that I always do this, but no. <laughs> I've had to repent of my fair share of temper tantrums. 
just ask the friends I have around me. But I do see that when I act out in anger, I am not living up to God's vision for the kingdom of heaven. So, praise God that I'm forgiven. Praise God for Romans 12, where Paul writes that God is the one that's transforming our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Actually, as we end here, let me just end by reading all of Romans 12. I don't know, sit back, don't explore it. Let's just let the soothing words of the scriptures soften our hearts and calm our anxious minds. Paul writes this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortations, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You see, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in your zeal, but be fervent in your spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. And don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. But do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time.